Hello Rebels, Garrett Robinson here, independent author of the Realm Keeper series, the recent novel Rebel Yell, Touch Trilogy, Non-Zombie 1 and 2, Hit Girls, non uh, The Ninja Bread Man, and currently the fantasy serialized adventure Nightblade, a new episode of which releases every Friday at noon Pacific Standard Time. This is my show vlog a novel where I live create books for you from beginning to end, everything from outlining to writing the first draft, editing, and currently audiobook narration. A couple things to know, you can buy this episode at the first link in the bottom section of the window, uh, garrettbrobinson.com slash nb-6. You can also become a subscriber on that page. That is uh, the best and cheapest way to read the series. You get the episodes before anybody else. You pay $3 a month, which is cheaper than buying the episodes and cheaper than buying the volumes. Um, and I actually earn more that way as an indie author. It's just it's just the best all around. It's the Why wouldn't you do it? It's the best thing. So let's get started narrating the audiobook for this sucker. Check, check, check. <clears throat> me, 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 me. Oh man, where's my intro? Arr, so annoying. There you are. Nope. <clears throat> There it is. Check. Living Art Books presents Nightblade, Episode 6, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. You've been listening to Nightblade, Episode 6, by Garrett Robinson. For more of Garrett's books, visit GarrettBRobinson.com. Intro, outro. There you go. Oh, where did my episode 5 files go? Ugh. Things got really messy on episode 5. I lost my webcam, so I... I didn't do everything blog and novel style, and I got so unproductive without doing it on, on live webcam. It was weird. Yeah, well, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> so this is chapter six, so this is going to be... 5, chapter 25, 26, chapter 26. No. Yeah, chapter 26 and end on chapter 30, that's right. Check. 
Chapter 1 Chapter 26 They fled through the sewer for some time, or the rest of the night, or no time at all. Lauren scarcely remembered it, only vague flashes of fire as Zane kept at bay the children who pursued them. Finally he, or perhaps Jem, led them to metal rungs set in the wall. They climbed into the open air just as dawn broke in the east. Zane led them to a squat building caked with faded blue paint. Zane led them... <clears throat> this is why the audiobook narration is awesome, because you catch little things like this. He took them to a door set in the back wall and knocked three times, then rapidly twice. Jem must have noticed the somber look on Lauren's face, for as they waited he leaned over and put a hand on her arm. It was only a dagger. It was not worth your life. You'll get another. Lauren nodded, but she wanted to shake the boy until his teeth rattled from his mouth. It had not been only a dagger. Somewhere on the road to Cabris, her knife had become a part of her. It formed as much of Nightblade as Lauren did herself. A hatch in the door slid open, and a pair of wrinkled eyes looked out. Who's this? It's me, Marcus, said Zane. You cannot have forgotten my face in only a day. I didn't mean you, boy. These ones. The eyes swept across Lauren, Jem, and Annis, lingering on the ladder a bit longer. They are friends, said Zane. You may trust them. The eyes squinted tighter for a moment. Then the hatch slid shut, a door's latch sounded from within, and the door swung open. Zane ushered them in before following himself. Lauren found herself in a small sitting room with a round wooden table and three chairs. Though her mind felt numb, she took in some details here and there. A small fireplace in one wall, lazy smoke drifting up from embers. Bits of leather hung by wooden soles ready for crafting. A bottle of something red, sitting next to empty glasses upon the table. The old man who'd let them in looked around. He didn't precisely look angry. <coughs> the old man who'd let them in looked them over. He didn't precisely look angry, Lauren decided, but neither did he bear a look of welcome. Rather, he seemed the sort to think that everything might be a threat. Her eyes did not miss the dagger at his waist, or the knobbly fingers that curled and uncurled beside it. Marcus, I must ask you a great service, said Zane. I thought I provided one already, said the old man. Not everyone could get you a carriage so cheap. And I am grateful, you may believe it, said Zane. But now I need more. These companions I bring must come with me. With. These companions I must bring with me. The man barked a short laugh, holding neither humor nor incredulity. With a swift wave of his arm, he showed Zane to the table and offered him one of the chairs. Zane threw himself down gratefully, his hands going to the red bottle without hesitation. You want to sit, girl? said Marcus. It took Lauren a moment to realize he'd spoken to her. You other lot, make yourselves welcome on the floor. I can strike a fire if you've taken a chill. He looked Annis up and down. The girl had tried to scrub out the filth that soaked her dress, but she could not get it all. Marcus's nose twitched slightly. And mayhap fresh 
Perfect. <clears throat> and mayhap fetch fresh clothes. Ennis murmured thanks, and Marcus shrilled a short... <laughs> Annis murmured thanks, and Marcus shrilled a short whistle. A young girl appeared from the front of the house. For a moment she looked so thin, her eyes so wide, that Lauren feared she might be one of Auntie's ch Auntie. For a moment she looked so thin, her eyes so wide, that Lauren feared she might be one of Auntie's children. But this girl's dress seemed well mended, if rather plain, and she did not bear that haunted, hungry, lost look that all of Auntie's orphans wore like cloaks. Deary, fetch this girl a dress, said Marcus. None of yours, they're far too small. One of your sisters. Quickly now. The girl nodded and vanished. Marcus turned back to Lauren. Sit. You look half dead. Lauren shrugged and went to the chair by Zane. The wizard had already poured and drained one glass. He poured himself another, and then a glass for Marcus. A third glass he pushed toward Lauren. Here, something for your courage. Lauren looked at the glass. She thought it held wine, but a wine darker and browner somehow than she had ever seen. She had never had wine before. It was common enough at festivals in the birchwood, but her parents insisted she was too young. If she pressed the point, she knew what to expect from her father. And certainly... and certainly her parents had never seen the value in spending coin on something so frivolous as wine. Upon the night she left, in fact, she had planned to have her first sip. Her parents could no longer object. They sought to put her up for dowry, after all. And how could a man judge his... And how could a man judge his future bride if he could not drink with her? But then had come Zane and the constables, and she had left bef But then had come Zane and the constables, and she had left behind wine and festivals and her parents and Chet. Dear, dear Chet. Lauren looked at Zane as he sat across from her and wondered, would she go back if she could? Could she call herself happy here, now, in this place, when every waking moment seemed to be a flight from death or a fight for survival? Then she thought of her father's face as she loosed the arrow into his leg. No. No, she would never go back to that. She placed the glass to her lips and took a healthy sip. The red liquid poured down her throat, burning like mage fire. She almost coughed it back up, hacking and sputtering, but some part of her mind thought, I could stand another. Yes, good, isn't it? said Marcus, wrinkled lips splitting his pure white beard in a smile. My own make of brandy wine, and likely a bit stronger than you're used to. Lauren gulped and sat up straighter. She raised the glass to her lips again, knowing what to expect. The second time, knowing what to expect, the second time tasted much better, sickly sweet, biting, and warm. A bit stronger, yes, said Lauren, but not a bad vintage. Marcus gave her a final smile, then dropped it and turned to Zane. Well then, let's talk about your favor. I can't put these children on your carriage. What? Lauren, Jem, and Annis spoke all at the same time. Zane took another deep sip from his cup. 
Go on, then. Why not? I've got to pay my driver, as you know. His rates to move shoes aren't so bad, of course. Moving people is pricier. And you might think it's all the same moving one body or moving four. It's all one carriage, after all. But the constables catch you with one charge. Maybe they take a hand or a foot. Two, and they'll take your tongue and kick you from the city for good. But four, it means the gibbet. And you and I, and most importantly, he knows it. The constables only want me, and maybe this one said Zane, tossing his head at Lauren. The boy and the girl have done nothing wrong. They'd be nothing more than passengers. <clears throat> they can ride on the driver's seat with my friend, then, said Marcus. He studied Zane's face as it fell. As I thought, you're all of you running from something, and running from others outside the king's law is in many ways worse than running from constables. At least most constables won't slit your throat in the moon's light. How much would he need? said Zane. Marcus's eyes grew crafty. Well, I couldn't tell you without speaking to him. But let's say he'd do it for... Their voices faded to murmurs in the back of Lauren's mind. Her hand dropped to her belt where her dagger's empty sheath sat lonely. She stuck the edge of her thumb in its mouth, running it around the edge. The dagger of power. The dagger that could master a constable. The dagger her parents should never have owned, that had seemed as out of place in their kitchen as a dragon. Yes, just a hunk of fine metal wrapped in leather Lauren knew. But it was hers and she knew what she had to do. She poured the rest of the glass down her throat, wincing as the brandy burned, the wine rushing to her head. Then she pushed back her chair and stood, planting both fingers on the table before her. Zane and Marcus stopped talking at once, looking up at her in surprise. I won't be going, said Lauren. Zane blinked. You cannot mean to stay. Not for long, said Lauren, but I... But Auntie has stolen something from me. I must take it back. Zane looked over at Jem and then at Annis. Both of them shrugged. Have you lost your wits? It is a matter of honor, said Lauren. Zane barked a laugh. Honor. Who else cares for that, do you think? Do you think that thieving queen of infants will care for your honor when you come to her and ask for your dagger back? I will ask for nothing, said Lauren, surprised at the fervor in her voice. I will take it. Zane shook his head, reached over, and snatched her glass. It hardly seems possible that you should be drunk already, and yet it's clear you are. I'm not said Lauren, though she could feel a slight wooziness settling in. I'll do this and meet you on the road. Zane shook his head, poured another glass, and drained half of it. Lauren saw Marcus's mouth twist in annoyance. The wizard missed it, raising his glass to her and pointing one long, delicate finger. If you stay, you'll die. Simple as that. Or maybe you'll find yourself in a constable's cell and put to the question. If that happens, they'll know where to find me. So you see, more thoughts... Th so you see, more thoughts spur my decision than concern for your safety. I can't let you stay. Let me, said Lauren. Who said I was yours to command? Zane frowned, his thick brows drawing together again. No one, but I'm, you'll forgive me, wiser in this world than you've proven yourself to be. And yet we both find ourselves fleeing from constables, said Lauren. And in my case, because of you only. 
I'll take no lessons in right and wrong and wisdom from a wizard outside the king's law. Zane opened his mouth to speak again, but Marcus put up a hand to forestall him. Zane, she may have some merit. You cannot leave together in any case. Why not let her stay and one of the others? I'll find them passage in time. Time they do not have, said Zane. He looked at Lauren again and hesitated, as though he would say more if he could. Finally he stood from the table and made for the door they'd entered. Outside. Lauren followed, mind a blur. She could not have said whether it came from the wine or Zane's mysterious look. Outside the sky grew ever lighter as the sun cleared the horizon at last. Zane closed the door behind them both, then paced back and forth across the alley's width for a moment. When he stopped, it was to fix Lauren with an angry glare and a pointed finger. What game do you play at, girl? No game, said Lauren. Only I cannot abide the thought of Auntie keeping that dagger. Only I cannot abide the thought of Auntie keeping that dagger. It is mine, part of me. I will take it back or die in the attempt. No, said Zane, swiping his hands in a single line like a throat being cut. You will die. You'll find no oar, no chance for any other outcome. Who do you think you are, forest girl? One does not walk into a throne room and tell the king to relinquish his crown if one wishes to walk out again. Lauren's hand clenched at her sides. Lauren's hands clenched at her sides. You do... <coughs> Excuse me. Lauren's hands clenched at her sides. You do not understand. That dagger. I need it. I need to learn what it means. Zane looked mystified. A dagger rarely has a meaning. What do you speak of? Corin, she said. You remember him, the shorter constable? Zane nodded. When they caught me, Corin searched me and found the dagger. The moment he found it, he seemed a different person. He took me off alone, and once out of sight, he let me go. He told me... He said to tell my masters he had helped me. Zane's mouth fell open. Masters? What masters? I know not, said Lauren, only that somehow that dagger may stay even the king's law. Zane snapped his mouth shut, his eyes darkened as though remembering some unwanted memory, and again he bowed and shook his head. A matter of great interest, to be sure, but hardly a cause to throw your life away. The dagger could breathe gouts of flame and raise the dead, and yet in the Therianthrope's grasp you will never see it again. Lauren gave an exasperated growl. Speak like a common man, the were-mage. And if I must die fighting her, so be it. At least it is my own choice. That stopped Zane. Idly, he turned and ran his hands down the smooth wooden door frame of Marcus's house. You would risk everything for this. And more, said Lauren. When a part of you is in danger, you must be willing to risk the rest of yourself to save it. Zane rolled his eyes. If you would convince me, do not speak with such childishly eager words. Marcus accepted the change easily enough. Then it came time to decide who would stay and who would go. Jem insisted on staying by Lauren's side, and she felt glad for it. Jem knew more about Cabris than Auntie. Jem knew more about Cabris and Auntie than Lauren could ever hope to. Annis, too, wanted to stay, but Lauren would not hear of it. You must away, said Lauren. Your mother hunts you most eagerly. You stand to lose much if she catches you. You stand to lose much more, said Annis, pouting. 
Lauren smiled at that. Indeed, but she will not catch me. She gave me the means for her own defeat. She swept the cloak up and across her face dramatically, until only her eyes showed through a gap in the cloth. Annis slapped her arm. Don't be ridiculous. You must promise me, promise, you understand, that you will be careful. I promise, and willingly. As Marcus summoned his friend, the carriage driver, Annis changed to a new dress of muted gray. She and Zane wrapped themselves heavily in rags stained with shoe polish, gifts from Marcus's refuse heap. They would pose as lepers one last time, hoping for constables to give them a wide berth as they left the city. We will ride south until sundown and find a place to wait, said Zane. On the third night from this, we shall depart again. I hope against chance that you will depart with us. I will be there if I can, said Lauren. If you do not see me, see Anna safely to the next city. Beyond that, I will not burden with you. Beyond that, I will not burden you with her. I will do as you ask. Zane turned and boarded the carriage. Annis approached next. The girl's usual bluster had fled, and her lip quivered as she looked up at Lauren. Will you not think upon it one last time, and come with us? said Annis. I promise I will buy you a finer dagger than you've ever seen if you'll only leave this stupid city. I'll see you two days hence. Spare no worries on my account, said Lauren. Annis nodded, but she looked miserable. Here, take this, she said. She reached into a fold of her cloak and pulled forth her bulging coin purse. In case you need it, I hope I shall not require it upon the road. Thank you, said Lauren. She only hoped that the coin would not find its way into Auntie's hands, pulled from her own cooling corpse. She stepped forward suddenly, speaking low and quickly. Do you spill... Do you still bear a certain package, one of brown cloth? Annis's eyes flashed. I do. It has not left my side since we escaped my mother. Take care of it, said Lauren. It may prove most useful, but whatever you do, do not tell Zane about it. Annis looked at her curiously. Why? What is it to him? Lauren thought of the constables and what they had said when they had caught her. Mage stones they had called the black rocks. I do not yet know, said Lauren. Only I know he should not know you have it. Not yet, at any rate. Be safe. She helped Annis board the carriage. The driver, an obese man with one eye, snapped the reins, and the carriage rolled off down the street. Now there goes your best chance of escaping this city, said Jem. I say your best chance, of course, for it's well known nothing can kill me. Well known indeed, said Lauren. Come, let us eat. We have a robbery to plan. Eskadoosh. What's up, what's up?
I can't wait until I am done and I can go to bed. <laughs> Uh. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> in case anybody's watching this live or watching it at some point in the future, like 40 people have downloaded the Nightblade audiobooks. Um, spread across the titles, but like, you know, 25 people on the first one, 10 people on the second one, and three people have already moved on to the third one, so, or five people, or whatever makes sense mathematically. Um, so, yeah, if you're watching this, big, big thanks. That's like really, really cool. I didn't know if anybody would be interested. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Chapter 27. Marcus fed them small bowls of gruel, served in the cellar beneath the floor of his home. Marcus fed them small bowls of gruel, served in the cellar beneath the floor of his home. He did not speak over much, nor did he linger after giving them their bowls. If you remain in the If you remain in the city by nightfall, you may sleep here if you wish, he said. Come down to the cellar. Come here, to the cellar. I will have my granddaughter fetch you blankets and open the door if you should knock. He vanished before Lauren could thank him. I find that one most strange, said Jem. Why should a cobbler be in the smuggling business? Will you keep your voice down, said Lauren, keeping hers to a murmur. One should always respect one's host. And why should you expect a cobbler any less than any other? What profession should a smuggler... What profession should a smuggler find herself, to your mind? Something natural, said Jem. Like a carpet maker, or a brewer. Someone who makes big things, the kind of things you can stuff a body in. Lauren shuddered. A body living or a corpse? Either, said Jem. He spooned up the last of his gruel, slurping noisily as it slid down his throat. The boy ate like three men twice his size, a symptom, Lauren supposed, of rarely having enough to eat. Then he leaned back in his chair and fixed Lauren with a hard stare. What's this all about to you, then? Lauren swallowed her own spoonful, wincing at the slimy way it sat in her mouth. What do you mean? Oh, I heard what you said to Zane, said Jem. But anyone in your case with half a pound sense would flee this place if they had half a chance. You had more than half a chance, yet you're here. I can't figure it. Lauren scowled at the table. A great thief cannot let others rob her and simply accept it. Who would respect her then? And that's the other thing, said Jem. Look at you. Tall, strong. Not ugly, I guess, though I've seen much prettier. Lauren glared at him. Jem cleared his throat. Well, er, uh, and you don't look like you've gone hungry more than a day in your life. So what brings you to Cabris, looking for Auntie and seeking to become a pickpocket? Who goes about searching for a way outside the king's law? Lauren scoffed. You're one to talk. You've lived without it your whole life. 
No other opportunity presents itself to one such as me, said Jem. If I have to lift a coin or slice some purse strings here and there, well, that's what I've got to do. You, though, you could build yourself a little house in the forest by some river. I'll bet you could live there just fine. Find yourself someone to live there with and all. Yet you come in here with half the nine kingdoms breathing down your neck, looking to lift purses what you don't need. I'd never take from those who had none to spare, said Lauren. She felt her temper rising, blood rushing to her face. Oh, said Jem, what of the girl in the pink dress Auntie sent you after? That was Auntie herself, said Lauren. Aye, and you didn't know it until you had your hands on her purse said Jem. She looked rich, Lauren insisted. Anyone who can afford a dress like that can lose a purse of coins and retrieve another in an instant. Some might say the same about your cloak, said Jem. Lauren's hand went to the black velvety fabric, stroking it gently. This was a gift, she said softly. Maybe that pink dress was too, said Jem. Or maybe she only bought that. <clears throat> or maybe she only bought that dress from coin what she earned. Earned doing things you'd never do, that you'd think were beneath you. I know many pretty girls with fine dresses what pay for those dresses with the failings of rich men. Lauren pushed her bowl away and stood from the table. It's time for us to go. I have an idea I like better, said Jem, rising as well. Why don't you take those coins Annis gave you and the ones you've got already, buy us a horse, and leave this city forever? Find Annis and Zane upon the road, and together we'll ride off to the Far Kingdoms, where they've never even heard of Cabras, and we've never heard of them neither. I will not leave... <coughs> I will not leave this alone said Lauren, slamming her hand on the table. No one steals from Nightblade, especially not that simpering witch. Jem paused for a moment, letting hang her angry words and all the meaning beneath them. Lauren came to herself and withdrew her hand. Where do we start? What are we looking for? My dagger, or Auntie, though not if I had my wish. She'll have put it in the hidey hole. They fetched more rags from Marcus's workshop and wrapped themselves tight. Neither Auntie nor her children had seen that trick the day before, and mayhap it would see them through again. Lauren left her cloak in the cellar, folded neatly under the table. Lauren led the way up from the cellar and out the back door, but once they walked upon the street she let Jem walk in front. Sometimes he led her across streets, sometimes for a brief stint up a rain gutter and across rooftops that burned hot even through her boots. She could not imagine how Jem stood it, but then he had probably walked barefoot all his life. Other times their course dipped through the sewers, but only for a short time. When they had to enter that dark place, Lauren could feel her pulse thundering through her, every echoing noise like a slap at her ears that sent her jumping in fright. The wandering course let her appreciate the three levels of the city as she saw them. Most of those who lived in Cabris only ever knew the one, the streets and their alleys, which probably held enough danger and darkness for the average man or woman. Above stretched the roofs, Lauren's <laughs> salud. Above stretched the roofs, Lauren's favorite. There she was like a bird, looking down upon and scoffing at the petty lives of those beneath her feet. The sewers she liked least, and yet she saw their advantage. No one wanted to go there. 
Only those willing to brave the dank darkness and smell would even venture into the sewers, and such people were few. After a time, Jem led her below the streets again. In the sewer, he led her on a winding course. Oftentimes, the tunnel branched in three or more directions, but Jem always chose his course without fear. Lauren saw that not all the tunnels channeled in the waste and garbage of the city, but some... Lauren saw that not all the tunnels channeled the waste and garbage of the city, but some instead ran with water. She would not have drunk it, but it certainly smelled better than the other tunnels. Twice they came to long sloping... <clears throat> she would not have drunk it, but it certainly smelled better than the other tunnels. Twice they came to long, sloping slides that descended still further into the city's underbelly. These always ran with water, and after Jem led the way, Lauren flung herself down them with wild cries of delight. The wind rushed past her ears as she slid down, down, down into the darkness. After the second slide, Jem began to pause at every tunnel's intersection. He would slide carefully up to the corner, poking one ear around it, then an eye. Once satisfied, he would lead the way forward again, but Lauren took from his manner that they must not speak. Here the daylight no longer came from holes in the street above. Instead, torches sat in wall mountings, casting dim... Instead, torches sat in wall mountings, casting a dim orange glow every thirty feet or so. Darkness stretched long between them, and twice Lauren stumbled over something in the blackness. What it was, she could not have said, and did not wish to know. Let us take a torch, she whispered to Jem. I cannot see a thing. Neither can they, said Jem. You take fire with you. You're nothing but a target. Light bounces in all directions. He shook his head at her and walked on. Lauren stuck her tongue out at his back. Maybe it had been a foolish idea, but he had no need to act like that. Ever onward they pressed, and ever slower grew Jem's footsteps. Finally he stopped at a place where two tunnels ran into each other and split off in four directions. He waited for Lauren to draw close, then motioned for her to lean down so he could whisper into her ear. The hidey hole awaits just round the next corner, he said. It will be guarded. We cannot go too close. Just let me see it, said Lauren. Then we may determine our course. Jem nodded and stepped round the corner. Lauren slid after him, keeping to the curved wall. Another torch sat in the wall thirty feet away. Jem edged forward until his feet neared the edge of its light. Then he pointed to the tunnel's end, but Lauren had already seen them. Two guards... Then he pointed to the tunnel's end, but Lauren had already seen them. Two guards stood there, a hundred yards away or more at a joint where the tunnels split both left and right. In the wall opposite the split lay a small hallway, no more than twenty feet long, and at the end of that hallway stood a tall door made of wood. There, said Jem, is the hidey hole. Lauren looked it over. The wood looked thick and strong, and she saw the gleam of a metal lock at the handle. <coughs>
Two guards stood there, fifty yards away or more, at a joint where the tunnels split both left and right. In the wall opposite the split lay a small hallway, no more than twenty feet long, and at the end of that hallway stood a tall door made of wood. There, said Jem, is the hidey hole. Lauren looked it over. The wood looked thick and strong, and she saw the gleam of a metal lock at the handle. The walls around the guards bore many torches, and their burning light made it hard to see much more detail from this far away. What does she keep in there? said Lauren. Anything special to her? said Jem. Some clothes, souvenirs. Sometimes the big boys, those are two of them there, will steal something beyond the norm, and she'll put it in the hidey hole. None of us are allowed to go down there, except the big boys she sends to guard it. I've only been here before because I'm, well, I was. Her favorite, said Lauren. She heard the twinge of pain in his voice, and sought to reassure him by putting a comforting hand on his shoulder. He looked up at her, but did not smile. That's it, then, said Jem. What now? Now, said Lauren, we find a way to... A loud, clanging screech tore through the tunnel. Lauren's fingers tightened so hard on Jem's shoulder she feared she might draw blood. The door to the hidey hole... The door to the hidey hole swung open, and Auntie emerged. One more boy she had with her, following dutifully at her heels like a... The door to the hidey hole swung open. The door to the hidey hole swung open, and Auntie emerged. One more boy she had with her, following dutifully at her heels like a massive puppy dog. It's her, said Jem. We need to go. Hold a moment. Why? Lauren did not answer, only watched. After the boy stepped out behind her, Auntie turned and closed the door. She pulled something from her neck and fiddled with the door's handle a moment. A key for that lock, thought Lauren, then turned and walked down the short hallway leading out. The boys guarding the place str The boys guarding the place snapped to straight postures as she approached, like constables or soldiers coming to attention. Auntie stepped up to one of the guards, reaching up to wrap her arms round his neck. She yanked his head down and placed her mouth on his. Lauren could not see at this distance, but she grimaced as she imagined details. Then Auntie stepped away. <clears throat> then Auntie stepped away, seized the other boy, and did the same. Neither boy wrapped his arms around her, neither did let... Neither boy wrapped his arms around her, nor did either of them let the kiss linger over long. What? Does she... said Lauren. Any boy has to kiss her when she wants it, and more besides, said Jem. His voice had grown suddenly small, so quiet Lauren almost couldn't hear it. If you don't, she'll hurt you. You learn pretty quick. Some of the boys like it all right, especially the other things she does. Some of us don't as much. 
Lauren looked at him sharply. Jem's eyes did not rise to meet hers. Her throat felt suddenly dry, and she felt the slow burning anger rise within her again, that anger that always seemed so near to her now. Her eyes went back to Auntie, burning with fury, and saw that the woman walked toward them. She had left the two guards behind her and came down the tunnel with only the one she'd had in the room. Lauren feared to Lauren feared to let out so much as a whisper, so instead she grabbed Jem's shoulder hard. He looked up, then whirled with fear. <clears throat> he looked up, then whirled with fearful eyes. Together they slunk back, utterly silent, and vanished behind the corner. Jem led her down the tunnel a bit farther until they found a small alcove that delved into the wall a few feet. Here, said Jem, his voice a sharp whisper. It's not big enough, said Lauren. Trust me, said Jem, and he strode in. In a moment he vanished, ducking around a corner within the alcove. Lauren blinked, then followed him into the darkness. Within the alcove she found that it curved away sharply to either side. They huddled there together, hiding in the darkness, with no other sound than the gently flowing water of the sewer channel. But soon Lauren heard a new sound, soft, padded footsteps approaching. She leaned out slightly, just the edge of her eye peeking around the corner. In a moment or two she saw her, Auntie, strolling idly by as though on an afternoon walk. Her boy walked behind her, all height and muscle, bare arms looking like they could crush a skull between them. Maybe they could. Almost Lauren listened to her inner voice, the voice that... Almost Lauren listened to her inner voice, the voice that screamed for her to emerge, to attack, to leap on Auntie and... To leap on Auntie and tear at her until she lay bleeding in the flowing water of the sewer. But Auntie still had her knives and Lauren had only her hunting blade and Auntie had her guard. And most importantly of all, Nightblade did not kill. So she let them go. Just before the footsteps faded to silence, she heard Auntie's smooth, languid laugh drifting out of the darkness, chuckling at some remark of the boys. Lauren turned back to Jem. To start with, I will take back what she stole from me said Lauren, and perhaps not now, but one day I will make her rue the moment she thought to cross either of us. How does that sound? She had never seen Jem's eyes wider. You'll get no complaints from me. Good, said Lauren. Let's start with my dagger. I have an idea. Okay, I'm going to have to end off at this point because I am really tired and I have a class in the morning. <laughs> Fun. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for tuning in. If you did, I know we had a couple people popping in and out. I'm uh, just finishing up here. <laughs> oh, Lord in heaven. Ugh. <clears throat> 
Okie dokes, we will resume this tomorrow, finish the audiobook narration, and uh, get this thing ready to go up on ACX. Thanks again for tuning in. This has been Vlog and Novel. I will see you in the morning, afternoon. Bye.